Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to, to, to give a talk here. So I'll be presenting joint work with a number of my colleagues listed below. The central question of my research is, why does deep learning work? And in this talk in particular, I'll be focusing on why does deep learning generalize? There are a lot of exotic notions like generalization, out of distribution generalization, few shot learning, transfer learning, and so on. In this talk, I'll be focusing on arguably the simplest notion of generalization in distribution generalization. So why focus on the simplest notion? While there is as yet no satisfying theory explaining why over parameterized neural networks trained by variance of stochastic gradient descent generalize from training data to test data on standard benchmarks. And of course, without a solid foundation, we have little chance of understanding and taming more complex notions of generalization, such as out of distribution. This gap between practice and understanding is a growing liability as we start integrating deep learning into healthcare, self-driving cars, and other high-stake applications. In this talk, I'll describe recent progress past barriers. So let me start with a backstory. A few years back, Zhang et al. published a paper on understanding deep learning requires rethinking generalization. And now it's, you know, it's a well-known paper and well-cited paper, so I'm sure that a fraction of you know it, uh, where they show that networks trained on standard data sets could achieve both zero training error and good test error without any explicit regularization. They also observed that networks had a very large capacity, so they could memorize random labeled data sets. This is problematic for various theories, such as we see rata microbased for when bounding the error of zero one loss classes. And the bounds that you obtain on generalization error, which is the difference between training and test error, are vacuous. So at the time, the reaction from experts was that what was obviously missing from Zhang et al's story was margin and norm-based capacity control. And indeed, a few years before that, or one or two years before, Nature but all also had very similar observations showing that SGD's generalization error was not affected by increasing network size or lack of regularization. This motivated the authors to propose what they called implicit regularization as explanation. So the likely explanation was that despite there being no explicit regularization during training with stochastic gradient descent, um, SGD has some kind of implicit regularization, perhaps controlling the norms or the weights, maximizing the margin or whatever else. And um, you know, this is in line with work from, by Bartlett from 20 years back, where Bartlett proved generalization guarantees for neural networks in terms of the L2 norm of the weights. So he showed that no matter how large your network is, maybe even infinite, for as long as you have a small norm, you'll have a good generalization error. Bartlett looked like sigmoid networks and L2 norm made sense in that, um, in that setting. But when it comes to relay networks, they're invariant to various rescaling. So for example, you can upscale one layer weights, downscale another layer weights without changing the L2 norm. So Nature but all proposed a, introduced a path norm, um, based rata macro bound on generalization error, which was actually custom built for relay networks, It was scale invariant. So what these bonds say is that, again, no matter how, how large your network is, how deep, how wide, um, if you have a small norm after rebalancing the weights, perhaps, and you have a large margin, then you'll have a small generalization error. Again, your, the bound on the test error, or the difference between test and train will be small. What hasn't really been appreciated or haven't been, had not been appreciated at the time was the role of empirical evaluation. So margins, norms, they all are data dependent. And so the question of whether these bounds explain generalization and deep learning is somewhat an empirical question. And that's exactly what I did a few years back. So I went ahead and trained a small neural network on MNIST data sets, so handwritten digit data set. And I found that, sorry, whoops, let me go back by a couple of slides. And I found that the path norm that the bound depends on grows during training. So the x-axis here is training epochs, training iterations, I believe, and the path norm um, is plotted on the y-axis. Now, this wouldn't be an issue since the generalization is bounded by the path norm divided by the norm, sorry, divided by the margin. And for as long as the margin grows, it's all fine, and it does grow throughout training. But note that the path norm 
is plotted on the log scale and it grows much faster than the margin, overall leading to a vacuous bond, which is this green line here. And the orange and blue lines are the test and train errors. Now, one may ask, what if I add explicit regularization, minimizing the path norms? So perhaps, you know, SGD simplicity regularization is not sufficient and I need to explicitly regularize for the path norms. And if you do explicit regularization, and here are the middle and, and right columns, you'll see that the path norm does slow down, does grow, grow as, as, as much. It plateaus at a smaller value. But unfortunately, the margin is seen from the bottom row plots also plateaus at a smaller value and still leading to vacuous or you know, pretty loose bounds. So only when you have very high regularization of the path norms, as seen in this uh, right top plot, you'll have a non vacuous bound. So the bound on your test error will be, let's say, 80% in this case. But know that the train and test errors are now 30%. And this is a binary classification problem on a very easy data set, MNIST data set. So um, the, you, know, you kind of get a useless classifier at the end. And you know, in these particular experiments, I showed that the bounds are vacuous. So the, the, the bound on a quantity that's error between zero and one is above one, meaning that the bound is vacuous. But these experiments have been extended since and by Nagarajan culture, and they showed that even the dependencies on the, let's say, on the number of data points, the width the, um, of the network, they're off. So here I showed that empirically, the norms are not small enough relative to the margin to explain generalization in deep learning. And if we want to explain generalization in deep learning, we can't just find, you know, say that some X explains generalization, such as small norms and large margins, but we also need to show that we can find X. So if we train a neural network with stochastic gradient descent, we actually find X. We find norms that are small enough and margins that are large enough that lead to generalization. And this green part here is, is missing from the margin bounds. So what structure can we connect to generalization, both theoretically and empirically? If not margin norm, what is sufficient? So uh, a few years back, um, there were a few papers published showing that um, wide minima or flat minima generalized. And this actually connects to some older ideas. Um, and the idea is the following. So imagine that, or the, the idea that we had was the following. So imagine uh, here is your optimization surface. And as you D ends up, the, the trajectory is somewhere here, landing in this minimal region. If you perturb the, the weights, you'll actually, if you perturb within this region, you'll actually not incur too much extra error, training error. So the SGD solution is, the flatness means that it's, the SGD solution is invariant to perturbations up to some scale. And this is exactly what we take, um, take advantage of using fact-based bounds. And here's some older related work kind of on, on somewhat related ideas from 1990s and early 2000s, if you're interested to check them out further. So let me define fact-based, which will allow us to formally connect flatness to generalization. So assume that the loss is bounded and the nature chooses some data distribution D. We get to choose a distribution P on the weights, the so-called prior. So here is our weight space. And we choose, let's say, a Gaussian centered somewhere in the weight space. Then the nature gives us um, an ID sample training set S. And now we get to know the empirical risk surface over which we'll be doing our optimization. So in this example here, as seen on in these figures on the right, we see that there are two minima. One is a flat minima, another one is a sharper minima, but perhaps achieving a slightly smaller error, empirical error. Then what fact these bounds tell us is that with high probability for any posterior classifier Q, so I can put any distribution on the weights and the generalization error of this posterior classifier Q will be bounded in terms of the KL divergence between Q, my posterior classifier, and P, the classifier that I placed, um, that I chose before seeing the actual training data. So again, in this case, we can choose two Qs. So let's say we choose a Q here which is centered at the flat minimum region. 
And the variance is chosen, let's say, not to incur too much training care, right? Because if we perturbed it quite a lot, we would be, our error would be going up, training error would be going up. And we can choose Q prime centered in a sharp minimal region, but the variance has to be much smaller, of course, again, to balance the empirical risk. What pack based bound tells us is that the generalization, the bound on the generalization error of Q will be smaller than the bound on the generalization error of Q prime because the KL divergence between Q and P will be smaller than between Q prime and P due to Q prime having very constrained variance. So in our work, in our 2017 paper, we actually, we, um, we use pack based and we study classifiers Q that are Gaussians centered at the weights found by stochastic gradient descent. And we choose a prior P, which is also Gaussian centered at the initialization. So where SGD, SGD's optimization is being started from. And, you know, we, we actually, um, by combining pack base with explicit optimization of these variances to minimize the bounds, so with non convex bound optimization, we obtained first non-vacuous bounds for over-parameterized deep neural networks, which was, of course, a, an achievement. But, and, and unlike contemporaneous work on bounds, we focused on the empirical evaluation from the very start, which I think is very important when it comes to um, trying to build bounds, guarantees that explain generalization in deep learning. But there are a few weaknesses. The bounds are still numerically too loose to explain observed generalization. So, for example, in that case, we had binary MNIST data set um, where the test there was, let's say, 3% or so, and the bound was on the range of like 14 to 17%. So it's, you know, it's, it's quite loose. And another issue is that the bounds hold only for perturbed classifiers, not the original one, right? So we didn't just look at generalization here, all the weights found by stochastic gradient descent, but we actually had to perturb and fit a Gaussian around in order to use back base and obtain a bound at all. And the first issue is that the bounds don't scale correctly. So as we increase the network um, depth, I believe, we found that the bounds got worse. And in practice, the generalization error or the test error actually decreases as you increase the network size. And this issue arises due to the choices, particular choices of the prior and posterior. We chose them to be Gaussian, and the prior was centered at initialization. So the bounds depend on the distance of the weights to initialization due to the choice of the prior. So what are we missing? What are the barriers to explaining generalization? Well, I think there are three barriers. One is statistical, another one is computational and analytical. So generalization here may rely on favorable, favorable properties of the data distribution, but of course, real world data distributions are unknown. And if we center the prior to initialization, we don't take advantage of um, the nice properties of the data distribution potentially. And our barrier is computational. Generalization may rely on quantities that are known, but are hard to compute. So for example, you know, if we could write down the distribution that SGD samples from, perhaps we could do much better. And the analytical barrier is that generalization may happen in ways that our current mathematical tools cannot capture. So perhaps we don't even have the right theories to explain generalization in deep learning. So let me talk a little bit about overcoming statistical barriers and back base by data dependency. Tight pack based bounds depend on the data distribution. So consider a data dependent posterior Q. So some, some randomized classifier on, let's say, the weights of the neural network. This is the pack based bound that I had in the previous slides, bounding the generalization error of this Q in terms of the KL divergence between Q and P. Now it is well known that the prior minimizing the KL bound, so the KL term in expectation is actually a distribution dependent prior. So the optimal, the Oracle P star equals the expected posterior Q. A prior is actually a prediction problem. You're trying to predict where our Q will land given the data. And the unknown data distribution is a statistical barrier. So PACBase has this fundamental tension that it, the prior P can depend on the data distribution, but it cannot depend on the sample. But of course, our only handle on the unknown data distribution D is through the training data, right? That's all the access that we have. We don't have the data distribution. 
but as we show in our recent work is that in fact, or just actually to, to step back, one, one is actually wrong. So the prior P can depend on the sample. And we've shown this in the past and a few years back um, using differential privacy. So for example, the prior is learned on the training data, but in a differentially private way, meaning that we don't leak too much information about any individual data point from the training set, then we can actually get a valid bound that where P, the prior P is actually sample dependent. And more recently, we show that the optimal P star can actually be also data dependent. So even if you know the data distribution, the optimal prior may be a data dependent one, which is this P star on the bottom, where P star equals the expected posterior, but conditioned on some of the tra training data. So S prime is a subset of the training set. And this is the P star that was believed to be optimal in the past. So actually we construct an example where using some of the training data, in addition to the knowledge of the data distribution, we can improve our bound and it can make a difference between a vacuous and non-vacuous bound. So let me just give you a little bit more intuition on this. So let's assume that we train, here's our initialization at the uh, plus sign and our SGD trajectory. We train on all of the data, we find a classifier here, maybe we fit a Gauss in here to use my base bounds. If we center, if we don't have knowledge of the um, training data or data distribution, we may center prior at initialization. So this is this the the um, red illustration here. If we now instead of allow the prior to access a few of the training points that the blue curve, so our original run has access to in the first few iterations of training then actually we can totally match the first few iterations of training and let the prior train on the small subset of the data. We may find a prior that we can center somewhere here, which is a lot closer, of course. And since we are, uh, these are Gaussians and fact-based bound depends on the kill divergence between the two Gaussians. If we choose invariances, it will only depend on the L2 distance. So we really care about this, minimizing this distance in this case. If we allow the prior to depend on more of the data, we'll be even closer more of the data will be even closer, almost recover our posterior. Now, of course, um, let me just go back a few slides. Of course, note that the generalization error of Q is bounded in terms of the KL divergence, which is now decreasing the more and more we couple the priors to the posterior. But we are dividing by M, which is the number of training points that the posterior got to see, but not the prior. So our M will be decreasing the more coupling we do. So there's, of course, this trade-off between how much data you use and how much uh, KL term can be improved. But I think you kind of get an idea how, you know, especially in the cases where you have initial large learning rates and maybe they're decreasing later, it may be important to get the prior access to those first few data points of the posterior sees in order to, you know, potentially break the symmetries and kind of um, see better where the posterior will land, predict better where the posterior will end. So up to this point, we considered Gaussian perturbations of the SGD learned predictors, which allowed us to capture the role of flat minimum generalization. And in the next part of the talk, I'll consider Gaussian perturbations at every gradient step instead of just at the end, which will allow us to capture the role of minibash gradient covariance in generalization. I'll, um, I'll pause just for a second in case there are any questions on the first part of the talk. Okay, I'll move on and I can answer questions at the end. Um, so we'll consider perturbations, as I mentioned, every gradient step. So to every update of WT, um, WT which are the weights of time T, will be, not only will be taking a gradient step where it is the learning grade and F is our training objective, but it will also add this noise term where epsilon is sampled from a Gaussian. Eta here, as I said, is a learning grade, and beta is called the inverse temperature parameter. Now, for various different versions of like eta beta, you know, this can be referred to as smoothed SGD or um, various private versions of SGD. Um, I'll just, for simplicity, really, I'll be talking about stochastic gradient longitudinal dynamics. 
which corresponds to particular choices of eta and beta, but particularly the case. So this additional noise term makes SGLD much easier to analyze compared to stochastic gradient descent. And the inverse temperature parameter that appears here in the noise term, it trades off exploration versus optimization. So if you look at this one-dimensional visualization on the right and start our stochastic SGLD run at the cross, um, if you run, let's say, just you know, gradient descent, we'll all go to this minima here, the closest one. If you run SGLD with um, enough noise, we'll actually end up sampling. So it will be due to the noise term, perhaps we'll be hopping over this minima, sampling a little bit here, maybe going back to sample a little bit here. So there are two views that one can have of SGLD. One is that it samples from a Gibbs distribution, the density proportional to exponentiated and rescaled um, uh, empirical risk or, or some other objective that we are optimizing. But this happens only under unrealistic assumptions if you, you know, run it for a crazy amount of time and, and so on. Another view is that it optimizes. And the resulting weights that you learned after optimizing with SGLD do not carry too much information about the training data S. Now, what I'll be asking in the second part of this talk is, does this latter view explain generalization of SGLD? And we'll be using information theoretic bounds to do so. Let S denote the training data sampled ID from the data distribution D and W the learned weights that are the output of running our algorithm, in this case SGLD, on the training set S with some additional randomness U, such as mid batch order or um, the Gaussian noise term that we are adding every iteration. Then the expected generalization here is defined as uh, for a particular predictor parameterized by W is defined as this expected difference between risk and empirical risk. So in other words, really between uh, test error and train error. So assume that the loss is bounded, then Jean Roginsky showed that expected generalization error, absolute value of it is bounded by the this mutual information term between the weights at the end of training and your training set S divided by the size of the training set. So we'll be using this information theoretic bound to try to um, capture kind of the information leaked by the weights about the data set. And we'll be asking, does this theorem explain generalization of SGLD? Again, the, we run into two barriers. One is statistical barrier. So the mutual information term depends on the unknown data distribution T. D. And another barrier is computational. Even if the data distribution were known, the mutual information term is actually intractable because it's hard to, again, as I mentioned a few slides back, to write down the distribution that HD or HLD samples from. So let me start by addressing the computational barrier. Even if the data distribution D were known, the mutual information term is intractable. So let ST denote mini-batch at time T, so some subset of our full training set S. Pense Jung and Lo in, 20, in their 2018 paper, they observed that the chain rule on mutual information implies the following. The mutual information between the data and the weights at the end of training is bounded, can be bounded in terms of the mutual information between the data and the whole trajectory from the beginning until the end, which in turn can be decomposed into these stepwise mutual informations. Um, where we sum over training time and we'll compute the mutual information between at time t between the minute batch s t minus one and the weights conditioned on the trajectory prior to that point. So in words, the information leaked about the data by the final weights at the end of training is less than the information leaked about the minute batch at step, at step time t summed over step times, um, different training steps. So the next hurdle is that this even this one step mutual information, where we wanna, only want to compute the mutual information of the next step given the trajectory, is unknown and also intractable. So again, we have run into statistical and computational barriers. So to address this, I'll be using the following insight. This one step mutual information is optimal expected loss in the following prediction game. So consider a game where you observe the trajectory up to time t, so we observe all the W0, W1 up to WT. And your goal 
is to estimate the distribution Q on the next step on the next weight. So the distribution of WT plus one conditioned on where I'm right now and all the past iterates and my mini batch at time T. So this Q has access to the mini batch. But of course, I don't have access to the mini batch. I only have access to the past trajectory. So I need to make a prediction, um, some distribution P that will only depend on the past iterates rather than ST as well. I'll be paying a loss, which is a KL divergence between Q and P. Um, and actually, as, as mentioned in the back base part, my optimal P star minimizing the KL term and expectation is the expected posterior Q. And then the expected loss, or expected KL divergence, given this optimal strategy, for this optimal strategy, is exactly actually my one-step mutual information term. So this one-step mutual information is the expected loss in my prediction game. Now, of course, P star will depend on the unknown data distribution. We don't, we don't have access to it. But of course, note that every prediction scheme P that is not optimal potentially yields an upper bound on mutual information. So for any P that I choose, the expected KL divergence between Q and P will be upper bounding the mutual information term, which can be obtained using P star. Um, so stochastic gradient launch of the dynamics adds this Gaussian noise term, which makes Q take a very nice form. Since I have access to um, WT and ST, I know exactly the, the, um, the mean of my Gaussian, which is of course just the update of WT minus the gradient. And I know the variance term because I know the variance term of this Gaussian, right? So Q, you know, it takes a very nice form, just a, a simple Gaussian, but of course it depends on ST. Going back to Pensa Jug and Law analysis, where they, um, bounded the mutual information term in, term in terms of this stepwise mutual information, they play the following game. Again, they observe the trajectory at the time t. They want to estimate the same posterior q, as I mentioned previously. And their prediction, the prediction that they choose to make is a Gaussian, which is just centered at my current weights. But of course, with the same variance, because I have access to the variance. So since they do not have access to ST, they just predict um, the current location. Then they will be paying like a loss, which is the KL divergence between Q and P. Since both are Gaussian with the same variance, it will only be the difference, the, the norm of the difference between their means, which is just the size of the gradient, which can be bounded in terms of the Lipschitz constants. And the bound that they get in the end on the expected generalization error depends on this kind of sum of our training steps of learning grade times the inverse temperature parameter times the um, Lipschitz constant. But here's the, the following limitation of these bands. We must predict the next weights given where we are right now. So we must predict WT plus one given WT and everything prior to that, but we have no access to the data. How we solve it in our NURBS paper is using conditional mutual information where we condition on all but one data point. So now the prediction game becomes a little easier. Not only we observe the trajectory up to time t, but also we observe all but one but the j data point, which is random. And we want to estimate still the same posterior q, but now we can make the following prediction. We can make a prediction p, which equals to q if our mini batch um, is contained in the sample that we got to observe, right? Or we can make a prediction p, which is a Gaussian, where we take a gradient update only on the data, again, that we have access to in this mini batch. And we'll be paying, we'll not be paying no loss at all if we happened to have a mini batch that we have access to. And if we don't, we'll be paying, again, it's just a KL divergence between these two Gaussians, Q and in this form of P. And we'll be uh, paying a cost, which is, the norm of the difference between the two gradients, where one gradient is taken on all the mini batch data, and another gradient is taking, taken on the mini batch, excluding the JV data point that we don't have access to. We refer to this term as gradient incoherence. So let's look empirically again how these terms behave. The blue 
uh, line is the size of the gradient. And the red line is this uh, incoherence term that I introduced in the previous slide. And we see that these, these are three different plots, so three different data sets, MNIST, Fashion MNIST, and CIFAR-10. On the x-axis, again, we have training epochs, and on the y-axis, which is the size of these quantities. And first of all, one thing to note is that this gradient and coherence term is orders of magnitude smaller than the size of the gradient itself. On MNIST and Fashion MNIST, we also see that it vanishes with training time, but unfortunately does not vanish with training time for CIFAR-10. If we evaluate the actual bound uh, for a couple of different step sizes, the bounds by Moetal that depend on the size of the gradient are the top two, and ours are the bottom two that depend on this incoherence term. And we see that the Moetal bounds become vacuous within the first few epochs of training because the gradient norms are not vanishing. But since the incoherence term is vanishing, our bounds grow much slower and plateau faster. But of course, they're still, you know, still large. And as I mentioned, there was an issue with C for 10, but they don't, that green incoherence term actually did not vanish. So the limitation of this work is that we actually have no control over the missing data point. We are missing the random JV data point and we have no control over it. Here is a solution that we proposed in our last year's NURBS paper. So assume that the training set is one of the following two sets, S prime or S double prime, where S prime and S double prime differ by only a single data point. We'll be conditioning on the union of these sets, which we call the super sample. And this is following the work by Stankins and continue from last year on conditional mutual information, which I encourage you to check out if you're interested. So we observe not only the trajectory again up to time t, just like we did before, but we also get to observe the super sample as prime and as double prime. We want to estimate again the same q. Now know that in the, in these slides I'll be talking about full batch gradient descent. So q will be the gradient will be taken on all the training data s, and our prediction. P will be the following. So we'll be with from Multifeta, we'll have a Gaussian uh, where we that centered depending on the gradient taken on S prime and with one minus theta, a Gaussian where the gradient is taken on S double prime. So since if, for example, at initialization, we have no clue which of the S prime or S double prime is our training set, you know, we can choose theta to be a half with equal probability we, we assign equal probability to both of these training potential training sets, and we um, predict B with theta equals a half. But don't forget that we also get to observe the past iterates W0 to WT, which provides evidence which of S prime and S double prime are actually our training sets. So formally, we actually have a binary hypothesis test, and theta this weighting here is chosen based on conditional distribution of missing data points identity. So if we train for a while, we have a trajectory now, you know, that trajectory will be leaking information on which of the S prime or S double prime is the actual training set. And we can start doing much better and make a better choice, better estimate of Q, incurring a smaller cost and smaller mutual information. Again, let's look empirically. And on the x-axis, once again, we see the uh, training key box, so this is full batch. And the um, um, red line is a bind depending on, on the norms of the gradient. The green line is our incoherence term, which for MNIST, we see that it's, you know, it slows down, doesn't grow as fast. For CIFAR, it grows and explodes, essentially. Actually, sorry, this is the actual bound, not, not the incoherence terms and so on. Um, and the blue is the new bound that takes into account the previous trajectory and is built um, on the work on conditional mutual information. And we see that it makes a huge difference for CIFAR. Initially, we incur a large cost when the trajectory doesn't leak too much information about the training set. But eventually the bound plateaus and actually stops growing because we essentially learned everything about, about the data set and we incur zero cost essentially. So what we've seen is that we can exploit flatness 
by adding noise to the final weights. So that was a pack based um, initial part of the talk. And we can exploit gradient coherence by perturbing iterates with noise. That was the GLD analysis. We can also use data dependent priors in both cases to reduce impact of the initial unstable optimization and not knowing the data distribution. And we can use conditional mutual information to reduce impact of measuring information linked by an entire optimization trajectory. But here's the important caveat. The bounded generalization error of perturbations of stochastic gradient descent, which is, of course, not the same as bounding, as obtaining bounds on learned weights directly, right? So we perturbed at the end or perturbed every step, but didn't look at the predictor we learned directly. How can we bridge this gap? So let, let W hat be the weights learned by stochastic gradient descent, and let the tilde be a perturbed weight distribution, so some kind of surrogate classifier. So what we've done in, in the work that I described before is we looked at the risk of this surrogate classifier V tilde, which can be trivially decomposed just by adding and subtracting terms in, in terms of the empirical risk of W tilde plus the generalization error of W tilde, which can be bounded, again, kind of standard approach, um, uniform convergence approach, bounded in terms of the empirical risk of W tilde, plus the worst case generalization error over all surrogate classifiers belonging to some surrogate classifier class. Okay, so this is just the a standard uniform convergence approach. A direct approach via uniform convergence would be bounding the risk of W hat. So again, we can bound the risk of W hat in terms of the empirical risk of W hat, plus the worst case of um, generalization error of all classifiers W, belonging to the some, some class, some hypothesis space, H where W that W had belongs to. And by, here's how we can relate W tilde to W hat. So indirect surrogate approach by uniform convergence of surrogate class yells the following. The risk of our original classifier can be bounded in terms of the empirical risk of our surrogate classifier, plus the worst case generalization error in the surrogate class that W tilde belongs to, and the difference between our surrogate and original classifier, okay, so the, their risks. And perhaps we can obtain some, some further bound on this difference in terms of the risks. Okay, so we can relate the original classifier W um, w hat to V tilde, the surrogate classifier, perhaps a perturbed version that we've been studying up till now. So is it worth the trouble to go through the surrogate analysis instead of directly bounding the generalization error of W hat and consider, considering a hypothesis class that W hat belongs to? Empirically, no direct approach on bounding generalization of W hat actually gives numerically no mechanism bounds. But in fact, there are further barriers as noticed by Nagarajan and Coulter a couple of years back, an analytical barrier. So a couple of years ago, they got, um, I believe like the, the best NURBS paper award for, uh, for their work on uniform convergence may be enabled to explain generalization in deep learning. They observed that in norm-based bounds, so such as the ones I described very early in the talk, the normal terms grow faster than square root of n. And note that all the bounds kind of have the complexity term divided by um, square root of the data points. Hence the norm-based bounds scale incorrectly with the number of data. So, you know, as we add more data, our, the complexity term will go too fast, still yielding non vacuous bounds. And in their work, they gave a toy examples where Azure D learns a good classifier so the one that actually has good risk, but nonetheless does not belong to a class with uniformly small generalization error. So if you took this uniform convergence approach that I described in the previous slide, binding the generalization error of, um, in terms of the word generalization error in the class, you will not be able to actually obtain such bounds. So hence standard uniform convergence arguments may fail to explain deep learning. So in fact, they show that, you know, directly bounding 
the generalization error of W hat using uniform convergence in deep learning may not work. And such a surrogate analysis that we propose might actually be necessary. So in our ICML paper last year, we um, propose a surrogate analysis where we show just a really simple equation and a, a, a definition of uh, a decomposition of the risks. But it's actually insightful and, and useful to think about generalization here in deep learning for surrogates. So for any surrogate hypothesis V tilde, the the difference between risk and empirical risk for so the generalization year, the expected generalization year of W hat equals. So now I'll just be really adding and subtracting the risk and empirical terms of W tilde, but I'll be grouping it into three terms. The first one is the risk difference between our original classifier and the surrogate. The second term is the generalization error of W tilde, which we can bound uniformly over the class that W tilde belongs to. And the third term is the empirical risk difference between W tilde and our original classifier W hat. So the generalization error of HD can be broken down into three parts. The error from approximation by the surrogate and the generalization error of the surrogate. And we can bound this uniformly over a surrogate class. So this orange term. So our approach is to relate the generalization error of HGD to the generalization error of a better behaving surrogate classifier. So in particular, the ones I described earlier, where we perturb uh, the classifiers found by stochastic gradients at the end of training, or we perturb every gradient step. So the toy example presented by Nagarajan and Kolger admits a surrogate analysis actually by uniform convergence. And we further using the surrogate analysis, we further show that um, for those familiar with Bartlett, uh, Long, Lugosi, Sigler work published in 2019, we show that bias variance analysis of overparameterized linear regression that appears in their paper can actually be seen as a surrogate decomposition and can be made uniform. We also show that surrogates can be defined by probabilistic conditioning in order to ensure risk differences. Difference is zero in expectation. So this first term, if you define the surrogate via conditioning, totally vanishes. And you only need to deal with the orange term and the last term here. So this is, I know, a little fast and maybe um, not too easy to understand if you don't have a background. But all this appears in our um, 2020 last year's ICML paper. And if you're interested in kind of uniform convergence approaches and generally um, kind of getting past the barriers of understanding generalization deep planning, I again encourage you to check out this reference or you can email me if you have any questions. So, so far we've discussed generalization bounds for two classes of surrogates, right? Gaussian perturbations of the weights at convergence and Gaussian perturbations are the weights at every time step t. Can we actually control, so we bonded the generalization error of the surrogate, right? But if you recall, there, is the, the, there are other terms, such as the risk difference between your original class friend and the surrogate. So can we control the risk difference term to get a surrogate decomposition? So, so far in empirical observations, the following, that all proposals to de-randomize back these bounds, so to connect the randomized versions to non-randomized versions produce vacuous bounds. And based on the graduates and culture work, one may argue that perhaps these arguments trying to do randomized back base bounds are too uniform. But again, I won't go into this into too much detail. So what structure empirical phenomena might surrogates exploit? Um, and you know, it's a it's a hard question. So again, going back to the surrogate decomposition. Um, you know, even if I find a surrogate, so first of all, choosing the right, it's, it's not clear what is the right surrogate to consider, but, you know, we need to choose surrogates for which we could actually bound general, their generalization error. So perhaps surrogates that belong to classes where uniform convergence can hold. But even if we deal with this part, we also don't need to forget that we need to consider surrogates that can be connected back to the generalization error of the original classifier. So to the risk of the original classifier W hat. And so far in my work, I've only really dealt with the orange part. There is some work addressing the, the first bit, but again, as I said, you know, there is no um, satisfying explanation yet 
and it's a very interesting area of research. So let me just uh, conclude now and I can take questions afterwards. Good generalization is a product of favorable properties of the data, algorithm, and the interaction between the two. So the bounds have to depend on the training samples and the data distribution if we have access to or the, perhaps we can simulate it to test our theories and see they explain generalization in deep learning. Empirical evaluation of the generalization bounds and measures is critical. Complexity terms that appear in the bounds are usually data dependent and empirical evaluation is the only way to know how they grow, where the bounds may fail and where we need to improve to make progress. So again, provide empirical evaluation, you know, um, I wouldn't have noticed a few years back that these, the norm terms grow too fast compared to the margin or looking at Nagaraj and culture work provide empirical evaluation, they wouldn't have noticed that um, the complexity terms grow too fast with the data. So I really believe that empirical evaluation is absolutely critical to make progress. Capturing data distribution dependence by using training samples allows us to circumvent statistical and computational barriers when evaluating theories. And um, in both, in fact, these bounds and information theoretic bounds, adding data dependence made a, um, added a huge improvement for the tightness of the bounds. And instead of bonding the generalization here uniformly over a hypothesis class containing the predictor, we should actually think about related predictors, so-called surrogates, that may belong to a class where uniform convergence holds. So again, this is for you know going around the barriers pointed out by Nagaraja and Coulter and thinking where we can use uniform convergence, um, but perhaps indirectly on a related class. And so far, we have made progress in studying some surrogates. So by perturbing the classifier stepwise or the end of training, but of course there is still a lot of work to be done. There, the dependencies are you know still not there. We can take more advantage, for example, of the past trajectories perhaps in information theoretic approaches. And of course, there's a lot of work to be done on connecting surrogates to original classifiers. Okay, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take questions. If you have questions afterwards, um, feel free to email me or if you want some references. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, so we have a few questions. And uh, like, uh, if, if we won't be able to answer all of the questions, I would encourage you to join our Slack and we'll post, uh, we'll, we'll enable the participants to post their questions on the Slack as well. Uh, but yeah, so actually with... about that. Mm -hmm. So I'm on Slack and I believe there is like DL Theory Carolina channel. Um, and it's probably way better than email. I'm happy to answer questions there and, and have discussions afterwards if any later questions come in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so let's uh, start with the questions. Uh, first one is, uh, does uh, SGLD generalize better than SGD? Assuming adding a Gaussian, a Gaussian noise at each step would help the algorithm escape sharp minima and prefer flat minima. Yeah, so um, excellent question. And, you know, in practice, actually adding Gaussian noise um, makes the test error worse. So, you know, people define actually generalization sometimes differently. When I talk about generalization, I often refer to the difference between the test and train error. Um, or some people just talk about generalization as a test error, so the risk. Um, but in any case, I'll just talk in terms of maybe test and train error, or risk and empirical risk to make it a little more clear. So if you do add noise, uh, during training, such as in HDLD, you actually, in practice, end up with worse risk. So your the performance of your classifier in practice does suffer. But um, if I recall correctly, the difference between risk and empirical risk diminishes. So the generalization gap or error diminishes. But I would say if you just want the best performing classifier, you will not be better off adding this noise. But it's really for kind of the simplicity of analysis that we, um, you know, want to study HLD. Yep, thank and you. that's, you know, and uh, just to add a little bit, actually, um, I would, 
there is a lot of work now on kind of how you know learning um, rare examples and small subpopulations is important for or memorizing those is important for uh, having small risk on those small subpopulations, such as work by Vitaly Feldman on short tail about long tail or backwards, I don't know, something like that. So again, you can read more there as well. All right, uh, yeah, let's move to the next question. Uh, next question is by Dmitri. He's asking, how does the generalization connect uh, to the work by Jonathan Frank uh, Franke uh, at all and on lottery tickets? Yeah, so um, so that, that work is my work and um, it, does connect there are many answers that i could give here so there is work in generalization theory on how compression um improves generalization so back base is actually kind of about that there there are bounds in terms of like minimum description length on connecting generalization um there is there are more recent approaches um by um so there is Sanjeev Aurora, the work from his group. I, I apologize for forgetting other names that are in that paper on relating compression and generalization. Um, there is a lot of follow-up work there. Uh, Victor Veach and his students, I believe, who worked also on, on compressing neural networks and showing that biopic base it gives a generalization. So anyway, there is a lot of work generally on kind of, you know, reducing parameter count or compressing um, gives a generalization, but uh, from my perspective, um, there is a kind of maybe less direct link, which is for this surrogate analysis. So I mentioned that you know we may we are interested in looking for structures, nice structures, in perhaps optimization landscape or you know like various invariances that our learning classifiers have that can be connected to generalization through surrogate analysis. And I believe that my work on linear mode connectivity could potentially po point the way um, and we could potentially propose new surrogates based on the nice properties that we uncovered of linear mode connectivity. But it's a, it's a complicated question and you know, it's, some of it is work in progress. So I'm, I'm happy to discuss it more in private, but kind of high level, I believe you know, one could come, come up with creative ways to connect these things. Okay, yeah, let's move to the next question. Uh, one more question for, from Dmitri. He's asking, uh, could you explain a, a little bit more what, uh, uh, and I'm trying to pronounce it, uh, we, uh, vacuous means, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry if I mispronounced it. Uh, sorry, say it again. Could you repeat, please? Uh, could you explain a little bit more what uh, vacuous means? Vacuous. Vacuous. What what means? Uh, I, um, vacuous bounds. Uh, vacuous bounds. Vacuous yes. bounds. Yeah, vacuous so bounds. Um, it, by that I mean, so we're often bounding the air, which is between zero and one, right? Um, and we bound this quantity, which is no more than one, by something that's sometimes orders of magnitude larger which of course does not, you know, it, it doesn't give you actually a guarantee, right? If my error is between zero and one, which is how it's defined, and I bound it by 10, what will I say about my generalization? What will this bound tell you about generalization? Um, so, you know, if, yeah, so that's what vacuous guarantee means from my perspective. Of course, you know, you could argue that maybe some constants are off and actually, um, by, um, for example, by, um, you know, if I vary the number of parameters or whatever, some hyperparameters, perhaps my bound will still capture when my generalization error is in increasing or decreasing. But in terms of the empirical guarantee, it's vacuous. So I have actually more on this work um, in our NURBS last year's NURBS paper on um, on the robust measures of generalization, where we 
propose a way to evaluate theories empirically. So even if they produce numerically vacuous guarantees, we propose a way to, um, to evaluate theories empirically using um, notions using notions from distributional robustness. So the idea there being that, you know, not only you want to maybe capture as you vary your hyperparameters, let's say not only you want to capture how generalization error will change on average, but you actually want to robustly predict which way your generalization error will change. So as I increase my learning rate, I want to predict that my generalization error will go up and down, for example. Anyway, so um, there is a lot more in, in that paper, of course. Right, uh, let's move to the next question. Uh, Lucas is asking if uh, empirical evaluation is still necessary. Doesn't it make generalization bound evaluation similar to simple test error evaluation? Bounds still can be very different for different data subsets. We are ending up with the same problem. Um, again, great question. And there is, you know, a little more again in this paper that I just mentioned on the robust measures of generalization. So I see two extremes. One is the um, bounds that purely depend, that are very, very general. And for example, like we see bounds that purely depend on, you know, the um, parameter count, let's see, and other notions of how complex your hypothesis space is. And another extreme is that you mentioned, which is, um, which is evaluation on the held out set. But of course, there's a lot in between. So the held out set bound will only tell you for the specific classifier that I obtained, how will I perform, right? It doesn't tell you at all why it worked, when it works, what if I change some, some things or retrain or um, even in the same setting, retrain in the same setting can, and, have a, and try to predict again. Um, you know, it doesn't give you any insight the bounds that we evaluate empirically, you validate empirically still maybe some kind of complexity measures that allow you to describe how your, you know, algorithm hypothesis class and data interact, right? Or perhaps you can capture how hard your data set is or, you know, any other aspects. So it still gives you a lot more insight and it's hopefully will allow one to build better and more reliable algorithms in the future. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's move to another question, uh, also from Lucas. Uh, he's asking, could you please list what topics in math planning in depth your last paper and other papers on generalization in general? Okay, you cut out in the beginning. I'm really sorry. What papers? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Could you please uh, list what topics in math is necessary for understanding uh, in depth your last paper and other papers on this topic in general? Yeah, um, so I would say the starting point is just statistical learning theory. And there are quite a few good uh, books and review papers. Actually, I can repost those on the channel. I posted it last time, but like the book by um, Scheib and David and a couple of other authors on the um, on understanding deep learning. Um, the first few chapters very nicely introduced various kind of simple notions in statistical learning theory. Um, and there are some review papers by Bousquet and many other authors. Um, then, of course, there is kind of the information theoretic analysis part, which doesn't really appear in these review articles. And um, for, for those, I mean, honestly, just looking over some recent papers, probably would be sufficient to give kind of good background. Um, but I can also look for better references on, you know, maybe some, a few chapters in a, in a book or a short overview paper that I can post in the channel. All right. Uh, I, I guess it would be really interesting to read uh, what, uh, what, uh, what you recommend. Uh, let's move to the last question. Uh, it's, it says, you mentioned that the empirical verification for generalization measures is important. 
Are you familiar with uh, Ableton studies in a paper called Fantastic General Generalization Measures and Where to Find Them? ICLR 2020. Is that the direction you imply? Yeah, so um, I am familiar with that work and our work on the robust measures of generalization um, is somewhat a response to that paper. Um, so in the fantastic measures of generalization, I believe kind of one of the arguments made there was that they're looking for causal measures of generalization. And I, I don't think that causality really has a role to play here. Um, you know, we may be able to explain generalization the quantities that are not actually causal acting on a generalization measure will not actually change generalization and we have a an example of um svms i believe in our europe's paper on the robust measures of generalization where we kind of explain why causality is not the right notion and something like distributional robustness seems more appropriate All right, so that was the last question. Uh, it was uh, really great to have you here today. And uh, thank you for all uh, for the presentation and for your amazing answers. I hope that the discussion will continue on Slack. Uh, 